Good afternoon. We're happy to welcome, welcome you to SPG's webinar, Nematodes and Pulse Crops in the Canadian Prairies. Important or just fascinating creatures? My name is Sarah Anderson, and I'm the Agronomy Manager for Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and I'll be your host for today's session. For those in attendance today, if you have provided either a CCA or CCSC number at the time of your registration, you will receive credits for today's session. After the webinar concludes, a recording will be available on our website, so be sure to watch for an email from SPG on how to access that recording. At the end of the presentation, there will be a live question and answer discussion. So if you have questions, please type them into the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel so we can address them at that time. SPG is guided by the grower elected board of directors, driven to create opportunities for profitable growth for Saskatchewan pulses. Two of SPG's five key result areas relate to research, development, and extension. With the purpose of increasing yields of established pulse crops and promoting the adoption of new pulse crop options. Today's session focuses on a topic that support these key result areas. We recognize the value agron agronomists bring to growers in Saskatchewan. You are key in spreading technical knowledge and widening the reach of this information to growers. So we thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We are pleased to be joined by Dr. Mario Tenuta, Chair for Natural Sciences and Engineering Research, Council of Canada, Western Grains Research Foundation, and Fertilizer Canada, Senior Industrial Research in 4R Nutrient Stewardship, and Professor of Applied Soil Ecology at the University of Manitoba. His training includes a Bachelor of Science in Botany and Physical Geography, a Master's of Science in Soil Fertility, a PhD in Plant Pathology, and a postdoctoral research in nematology. The Applied Soil Ecology Laboratory conducts surveys and research to track the establishment and importance of nematode pests in field crops and potatoes across the prairies. Current research includes the root lesion nematode and stem nematode of pulse crops and the soybean cyst nematode. Welcome, Dr. Tenuta. Thank you, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here. I'd like to uh, express my grat uh, gratification uh, to um, SPG for this opportunity to speak about nematodes. So, personal favorite topic of mine, one of my favorite topics. Some of you may know me more about nitrogen on the prairies. So this gives me a nice opportunity to talk about some neat critters and uh, let's have some uh, additional fun. So let's let's launch straight into it. Here you have uh, a nematode, two nematodes, a male and a female. The female nematode is here, and this is a plant parasitic nematode that you're going to be coming familiar with because you can see this stylet or this piercing apparatus here that gets protruded outside the nematode to feed on plants. Uh, this is a male, this is the tail end, and this is its reproductive uh, appendage. It's spicule, as it's known. And this we can tell is a female because of the female um, reproductive opening here. Now in this jar here is one of the largest nematodes that we know of, 8.5 meters, uh, placenta nema. This is a nematode that parasitizes the placenta of, um, I forget exactly which whale it is, a giant whale or blue whale, one of those big whales, okay? And so um, in plants and soil, they're small like this, okay? They're not 8.5 meters, and thank God they're not. Now, not all nematodes feed on plants. Actually, the vast majority, just like humans, the vast majority are great. Great nematodes, great people. Uh, just a few of them need a little bit of, um, you know, they, they've chosen a different way of making a living. And um, same with nematodes. We have bacterial feeding nematodes here that have these mouths that suck in bacteria in soil. We have algal feeding here. And then we have, uh, this is an omnivore that feeds on uh, very small invertebrates like uh, other nematodes and soil or plants or mosses with the spear. These are the carnivorous or um, um, uh, 
um, yeah, carnivorous or predatory nematodes with a big, wide, gaping mouth that they rip their prey with with the stationary tooth. Here's a fungal feeder. You can see this little delicate spear feeding on the fungus here. And here is the anterior head area of a plant feeding nematode. You can just see here the stylet or this pin just protruding out. If there was a root here, it would stick this right into the root and start sucking out plant juices and feeding. Now nematodes are extremely beautiful. To really see their beauty, we need to get really up close with, uh, and see them underneath microscopes. Here is um, the ring nematode with beautiful, beautiful annulations here. And here's a spear that you can see in it. This, this loves grasses. So a lot of our prairie vegetation, native prairie vegetation, would um, there would be lots of this um, ring nematode present there. Here's an elaborate, elaborate um, um, bacterial feeding nematode, Wilsonema, which is one of my favorite because this elaborate head apparatus. We don't know what the head apparatus does, but I imagine that it's there scraping bacterial films off of decaying um, uh, uh, roots and um, vegetation matter. And um, here's Bononema, which is more of a litter layer uh, nematode, actually. This one's kind of neat. It looks like it's got little legs for walking, but no, these are just for gripping and being held stationary. And then here we have a Crobelis. This is the anterior end, and it has this elaborate head structure here. And we don't know what this is. Again, it could be scraping. Um, bacteria films. I think of it as a farmer though. I think they're actually cultivating bacteria on this extra surface area and as they dislodge they're, they're, they can feed on them. Now nematodes are everywhere. They're in Saskatchewan, they're in Manitoba, they're everywhere. You pick highest mountain, uh, deserts, tropical, you name it. And just to give you an example, probably the, one of the most inhospitable places on earth, the Antarctic dry valleys, there are two species of nematodes, Scotnema and Plectus, feeding on algae and bacteria. And there's only like one day um, a year that those soils actually become above freezing. And these nematodes are there and they become active for one day and then they froze uh, they freeze for the rest of the year, just waiting to be active again. Now here's a good nematode. It's a carnivorous predatory nematode. Just captured another nematode. This is in the laboratory. And it's pulling the nematode into its very large buccal cavity or stoma or mouth and then with the with those muscles here these are the muscles here of the esophagus it's pumping the contents of the nematode into its intestines and this is great because it's basically a form of bowel control feeding on plant parasitic nematodes so so we need all these fascinating characters of nematodes in soil to give us a healthy soil food web and healthy community in soil. When things get out of balance, then we start having problems. Plant parasitic nematodes can take over. There's not enough checks and balances, and then there's not enough diversity in the system for plant growth. This often can happen in agricultural systems. Nope, we've had enough of that. Okay, nematodes respond in terms of their communities. This is uh, summarizes a whole bunch of stuff that we can't go into, but each of these dots area is a different type of community of nematodes. And you can see the potato rotations in Manitoba, they have a particular um, tight community here, as opposed to prairie vegetation sites, different here. Field crops like wheat, intermediate, okay? And here, for example, is even uh, tame hay that's been uh, in this case, tame hay that has had no nutrients added to it, and with manure added, it starts acting more like a, a prairie uh, vegetation. And nematodes are sensitive. Some are sensitive and some are not sensitive to stressors. So we can use them as bioindicators. Some of my earliest work I've done with nematodes shown here that um, very pretty much like higher, higher, if you want to call food web uh, nematodes, 
I can think of them as the eagles and the bears, um, the lions and, and cougars and so forth. Um, the CP, what we call CP4, or CP5 nematodes, very sensitive to ammonium, ammonium fertilizers, whereas uh, like plant parasitic nematodes and lower, um, um, well, other nematodes not sensitive to ammonium. And these are the ones here that were like those carnivores, uh, predator and nematodes that was provides lots of good service. We're not going to talk about all this fascinating stuff about food webs and the ecology of nematodes. When I came here, I thought I'd be working on a lot of that, uh, but it turned out very quickly that there was enough need to understand the basic biology of plant parasitic nematodes and nematodes with economic damage, because really there's nobody that's been looking at this on the prairies. So having a position at the University of Manitoba and my interest in nematodes allowed us here to um, uh, develop a program. And fortunately, we've been very, um, very, very fortunate to have the support of the pulse growers, uh, so got SPG, but also um, uh, Alberta Pulse and also Manitoba Pulse and soy growers as well, and Pulse Canada. Now, nematodes, uh, they're extremely important to us. You don't even know how important they are, especially in medicine. So this is uh, Cinerabdites elegans or C. elegans, the model worm. This worm comes from manure, humble beginnings, very humble beginnings. We've domesticated it, to grow it in the laboratory. We've identified every nerve nerve cell and connection it has, we've mapped that out and, and to learn about the human nervous system and its relationship to, to relationship to various drugs, for example. It's been sequenced, the very first animal to have its entire genome sequenced. We know the development of the worm, as it's called C. elegans, every single cell in its development from an egg to an adult worm and we use that development to understand human development and aging in particularly and what controls aging what damage and how to prevent damage from aging on uh, our bodies the worm has gone to space a lot of different times it even has a logo by um, nasa um, about um, going up on the delta mission um, in 2004, that's pretty cool. Um, a worm with a little helmet on, that's cute. And then here, uh, it's won the biggest prize in science, the Nobel Prize in, in medicine. Uh, sorry, in, in biology anyway, in terms of prize. And so pretty illustrious, the worms, you know, we're very, we'd be really thankful to, to the worm. Um, but let's let's dive more into biology and importance for us as, as farmers, as agronomists on the prairies. The life cycle of the, the nematode, uh, here's an individual egg that's been fertilized, and this is in, internal to the female, and it will start to develop as an embryo, and eventually will turn into a little worm inside the egg. It doesn't come out, doesn't hatch yet. This is still inside the female, and then that uh, juvenile, as we call it, or first stage larva, molts and goes to a second stage larva. And there, that, the, now this egg can be um, uh, expelled, deposited into the soil, soil solution from the female. And at some point, if there's a cue, particularly for us with plant parasitic nematodes, if there's a cue of roots of a species that that nematode likes to feed on, There'll be chemicals, compounds, organic compounds from the root that signal the nematode that it's time to hatch because there's a food resource available. Then the nematode will develop another molt and as it feeds in on roots uh, of plants, uh, or uh, in this case, because we're still talking about plant parasitic nematodes. And then there's a fourth molt where it loses its outer surface and then become a male or female uh, nematode, and then you have reproduction and you have continued again in terms of uh, eggs and so forth. So this is the life cycle. Now, how long is this life cycle? Anywhere between 30 and 40 days for one generation, okay? So think about on the prairies, we can probably get about two 
life cycles in two generations in on the prairies when you start factoring in soil temperatures and the, the, the uh, duration of our crops. Now, in terms of types of plant parasitic nematodes, we think of three groups here. There's the ecto parasitic nematodes which stay on the outside of the roots and feed on, and I'm gonna talk about several of those. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there is what's referred to as the migratory parasitic nematodes that enter and leave roots and stems of plants that we'll talk about as well. And then lastly, the endoparasitic, which set up shop within the root and don't move. Okay, this particular the females, they don't move, the males will move and go back in the soil and try to mate with the females because they can mate with them from the soil while the females in the root system. I'm not gonna talk about these uh, today, the endos, but the ecto and the migratory we will. Now, how big are these things? Well, generally, they are um, smaller than a pinhead, okay? And we're talking about one millimeter to two millimeters in length. So extremely, what are we talking about here? Sixteenth, one-eighth of an inch, not even one-eighth of an inch. And um, some can be long, uh, longer, but it's generally we're talking down here. And they'll be worm-like. Now, these sedentary ones, the ones that set up shop and don't move, they the females um, change their shape. They don't need to be worm-like. They're not moving through soil or moving within the plant. And they just become factories of eggs. Okay, and that's why they get nice and big and plump and produce a whole bunch of eggs inside them. Now, let's start talking. We're agronomists, farmers. Let's start talking about uh, yields and what they're doing Okay, so nematodes feeding, so plant parasitic nematodes feeding on crops, siphon root and stem contents, and basically robbing the plant of energy and nutrients, okay? And so the plant becomes weaker. They can compromise the root function of the crop by changing the morphology of the root by forming galls. So in other words, misshaped, misformed roots that really lack in root hairs. And also they can create lesions or damage zones on the roots where in which the epidermal and cortical cells of the roots die. And these now can be, these locations can be means for entry of other pathogens, particularly bacteria and fungi, to gain entry into the root and cause root rots, okay? And, um, this weakening of the energy stealing from the plant and also compromising the root function. If you imagine a root that's stubby with few root hairs, it's not going to be able to have contact with soil to be able to take up water, macronutrients, and even micronutrients. Need that surface contact, that surface area contact with soil and uptake of water to get those nutrients. And we have a problem here when we have a compromised root system because of nematodes. Above ground now, there are also symptoms, particularly of swelling and twisting of stems and leaves and intervenal necrosis, which first starts out as chlorosis in um, uh, foliar feeding nematodes. There are nematodes that feed on stems and leaves, and we are gonna talk about one of those today. And lastly, there are nematodes that vector plant viruses and that in their esophagus, they hold the virus and when they're feeding on plants, basically they're sloppy eaters and there's a little bit of saliva, and uh, well, not a little bit, they're actually actively putting saliva into the plant and um, well, I'm calling saliva, it's acts similar to saliva. And there, the, the saliva contains the virus. The virus is adapted to be uh, transmitted that way in that saliva transfer. Now, symptoms of nematode diseases, this is where a big problem is. They are tough, 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 tough to diagnose, okay? Probably one of the most difficult types of diseases to diagnose in the field, and usually they go, go um, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they go uh, overlooked, um, misdiagnosed, 
and it's for only years later after this situation is severe that actually somebody finds out that it's a nematode issue. So what are some of these symptoms? Dwarfing and stunting, chlorosis of leaves, intervenal necrosis if that chlorosis um, gets severe enough, root galling, and we have root galls here, you can see the, the root galls formed here on this, this probably looks like a tomato, uh, root rots, and again, that's probably the secondary um, infections. Lesions on roots, which are black. Um, the roots become really black and devoid of uh, root hairs. And stem swelling and stem twisting for above ground um, uh, foliar feeding nematodes. Now, there are some really, really uh, devastating nematodes and our government uh, tries to uh, regulate them uh, to, uh, limit their transfer within Canada and entry into Canada from other uh, countries. I'll give you some examples. Cis nematodes of potato, we have them endemic to um, Victoria, sorry, Vancouver Island, it's not Va Victoria Island, Vancouver Island, uh, spot in Quebec, Newfoundland. Uh, the potato rot nematode, uh, which is found around the Ottawa area. Uh, stem and bald nematode, Diptolenchus dipsaki that we will talk about to many provinces, particularly bulb crops, which is a quarantine nematode, the needle nematode, longidorous and hort crops, a root knot nematode of potato, the stubby root of um, various horticultural crops and corn, and the dagger nematode of many horticultural crops. And this is, these two last ones are viral vectors, and that's why they're so damaging. But there are other nematodes that CFIA, the Food Inspection Agency, um, uh, analyzes any plants and soils that come into Canada that are imported. If you're importing bulbs, if you're importing potted plants and so forth, they are inspected and analyzed for nematodes that are on this list, but there's a larger list that we don't have in Canada and we want to keep them out, okay? Now, the key thing here for us to understand is on the prairies, we're very lucky. We are extremely lucky that we have few excessively damaging nematode issues. So that's phenomenal. However, as we're gonna talk about today, there is, that doesn't mean we don't, shouldn't look at nematodes. We should be very quite vigilant and understand what we have because they can be problematic down the road. So let's start off with our first um, um, line of research that we've done in the laboratory. This is the story of the stem and bulb nematode and yellow pea. Um, Ditalancus dipsaki, which is a stem nematode, and it's on a quarantine nematode. In other words, we other countries don't want that nematode, and Canada doesn't want it. So um, um, the trade of commodities, especially grains, are can be limited if this nematode is found in export shipments. Okay, this a uh, beast. And here it is here in terms of a drawing. Here's the mouth area, the interior, and here's the little pin that gets ejected into uh, plants to feed on. Um, this is on the stem and leaves. Um, and then here it is, these little specks, it's like dust, but those are the nematode about two to three millimeters in length, okay? Um, lots of different crops that it's a host of, likes to reproduce on. <coughs> and it's a, um, a nematode that is changing taxonomically, we're finding more and more splitting up species from what we call just Dytelanca stipsaki. And this is really important because this is really at the heart of our story here today about the peas. So yellow peas exports to India is traditionally, or not traditionally, but over the past 10 years, very, very important for Canada. A large importer of um, yellow peas. Uh, Field peas to uh, from Canada, from uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Alberta, um, in, into India. Uh, India had the uh, has strict importation restriction of quarantine pests, and over 10 years ago, uh, CFIA was finding a nematode that nematode Dytelanchus dipsaki in the rare rare shipments, uh, or actually. Uh, one sample within a whole container ship of peas. So very few of the samples they actually sampled um, had the 
what they call this nematode. But if there was one sample that a whole ship, this whole ship would have to be rooted uh, elsewhere from India, uh, off course from India, and fumigated with methyl bromide, another country, and then CFAA could declare that it was free of the pest and go on to India. Well, this caused havoc in our whole export system because of the delay and also because of the costs and just really messed up contracts and so forth like that. So we thought something was really odd because it was very infrequent that this nematode was present. And I was thinking that, well, if the nematode really liked yellow peas, it should be much more prevalent than what it really was. Um, the industry, um, to its credit, the pulse industry really said, hey, let's really take a look at this. And so we, we initiated research with SBG and the other grower groups to look at this. We designed a grower pea grain survey that many of you may have provided uh, uh, graciously samples to us of your, your pea grain samples. We did a field weed survey in the fields, in farm fields. We did molecular identification of the nematodes that we found, and we did host screening studies in the laboratory. And what did we find? Well, we found um, of, of over 538 farm fields, we found only a few, a handful, that had the nematode, the Italancus nematode. And they ranged in uh, very low to pretty high. Uh, levels in the grain. And Dr. Breyer, when he was working with me, um, was leading this research. You can see it's across the, the prairie provinces within the, the pea growing areas and regions. Now, what we found was, and I was away, I remember, and, and I got a text message saying, hey, we found something bizarre. And that they said, my students said, we found the nematode emanating from debris. And I said, well, Let's find out what that debris is. Well, it turned out that debris was flower heads in those shipments of those samples of Canada thistle or creeping thistle. And the nematodes, and there they are there. See them there? Emanating from the flower heads of the, the creeping thistle. And we can get hundreds and thousands of the nematode, nematodes from the debris of the thistle. We're doing lots of different research, uh, various experiments and so forth. The students and technicians found that it's the thistle that the nematode is coming from. And it's not the peas. <coughs> now, so this is a, a field on, on my way to visit the in-laws in Gravelberg. And it's a yellow pea field with a whole lot of Canada thistle in it. It's not surprising then that Canada thistle is in the grain samples, okay? This is bulk shipments of, of yellow pea to be exported, and in some cases even um, upon export, the, the screening material from the elevators are added back in because you can have a certain percentage of foreign matter allowed and so um, we concluded that it was actually the creeping thistle uh, seed heads, mainly that were uh, getting into those export samples. And that was uh, having the, the reason for that nematode to be present in those shipments. The story continues though, because this is the beast here that countries do not want that particular nematode. And in Canada, we don't want it everywhere. It's uh, Ditalangus dipsaki, and this is on garlic, and it's prevalent on garlic in eastern Canada, northeastern United States, and anywhere that they grow garlic, and I'm particularly talking about even hobby farms. And on the right is the thistle coming, sorry, is the nematode from the thistle. You can see there's a, quite a difference in the shape, right? This one's a lot thinner. And uh, so we said, oh, might be a different species actually, what we're getting from thistle and not this quarantine nematode. And you can see that on thistle, we were getting lesions, twisting, thickening, swelling, 
and we could see the nematode. Here's, you can see the nematode in here, we stain it, and you can see the nematode in the stem material itself. So it's clearly thriving on the thistle, and it's damaging the thistle. So then we asked, what are you? Who are you? Are you the quarantine nematode? And it turns out it wasn't. It was a different species, a relatively new species called the Dedalancus wishera, not Dipsaki. There are a whole bunch of different molecular approaches, including sequencing to prove this. Here is the genetic um, conformity for the quarantine nematode here, and is very much different than the stem nematode of thistle that we have. So this is a different species. So now it's like, oh, whoa, hang on a second here. CFAA was calling it a different nematode. They were calling it this quarantine one. When we have this one, this, might, this is a whole new ball game here, folks. Why, what's the reason for fumigating these ships? It's a different nematode. Let's find out about this nematode. Does it deserve to have millions of dollars spent on it to fumigate? Um, it was more about the confirmation of the species. And then we wanted to see um, what does it like, okay? And growing, this is Alba Fossil here, PhD student of mine, who's now a professor at the University of Florida in nematology. And he showed, this is creeping thistle here. <coughs> the larger the bar, the more reproduces on the different plants. And these are, you know, wheat, canola, various pulse crops really, really likes Canada thistle, this wisher eye. Now, peas, it basically just about survives on pea. It just survives. It doesn't reproduce or grow on peas. Other crops, other pulse crops, including wheat and canola, it actually dies. So um, we, we have here excellent evidence that this nematode, a stem nematode, we're finding is a thistle nematode, and it really doesn't like other crops. When we look at the quarantine nematode that India wanted, you know, and, and CFAA said that we had, um, it likes garlic, which it should, really likes peas, which it should, and this is what Abba Fazl had showed, and it even likes uh, edible beans and um, uh, but we don't have this nematode we were not finding this nematode in our samples and CFAA then went back to their collection of the nematode from the ships and they used our methods uh, and found also and agreed with us that it wasn't Dipsaki but rather it was Wishurai the stem nematode of of thistle and being a parasite of thistle is not really a problem for countries. So that really assisted in um, saving um, time and money in not having to quarantine and, and fumigate ships and so forth like that. Now we're still continuing this research because there are other crops. We didn't, we didn't screen all kinds of crops and we didn't screen crops that other countries might be really worried about. So under the latest uh, Pulse cluster with SPG and Pulse Canada, we've been looking at vegetable crops, Asian vegetable crops, pr primarily from uh, subcontinent of India. And <clears throat> these are the different uh, uh, tomatoes, eggplants, there's hot chili peppers, um, um, daikon radish, onion, uh, okra, hyacinth bean, and um, a really unique, um, small um, round uh, yellow cucumber um, and what are we challenged with adding our nematode the thistle nematode and found it did not survive zero zero collect and you can hear the plants growing it's like a friggin jungle in the greenhouse with all these crops growing because a lot of them are climbers unlike a lot of our our veggie crops um, but on thistle, loves thistle 25 times it reproduced its uh, its level, which so this is really conclusive evidence that there's very little risk here of that nematode. 
Okay, that's not that that's not the end of the story here. I told you about garlic. And most places where garlic is grown has problems with the quarantine nematode. We did find one field, sorry, two fields in um, uh, Manitoba that garlic growers came to us with uh, rotting, festering, smelly garlic bulbs. And when they showed me these bags of this rotting stuff, I said, uh oh. And we looked at uh, the garlic, tons of nematodes in there. And you can see them there. And this is the nasty nematode that uh, the, the tzaki that we want to keep out, okay? And so um, what happened is that these garlic growers obtained garlic bulbs from Ontario, and those bulbs were infested already with the nematode, and they planted them here. And then they, when they, um, that following spring, they uh, start to rot. You know, you think you have fusarium, but really it's because a nematode is, is causing the primary damage, okay? So this is an important story for us. Because remember, this nematode does like yellow pea. And I think we, this is where we have to be very vigilant and get a message out there for garlic growers. And a lot of people say, oh, well, we don't grow much garlic on the prairies. But oh, yes, we do. Any city will have garlic growers and they pr primarily go to farmers markets selling their wares. So we do need outreach to those growers to say, hey, let's be careful. Let's use certified seeds or do some hot dipping, hot water dipping to um, uh, kill the nematode but not kill the bulbs uh, and keep an eye on sampling um, and keep an eye on for um, the rot. I think it's called basal plate rot. Um, and so we need to be vigilant because we can have peas in proximity to garlic, especially around our cities and larger communities, okay? All right, let's change gears now, talk about the soybean cyst nematode. This is the, the long march of the soybean cyst nematode from its discovery back in 1957 in the southeastern US to present day. And you can see it's moving north. I really want you to look at Manitoba here and let's see the nematode coming up and watch it come up the Red River Valley there and then blue, now it's gonna be in blue. See those blue RMs there? That's what we've been able to fill in in the past, what, four years with our research with our students here, um, uh, surveying soybean cyst nematode in Manitoba because we've been able to really document probably the best anywhere of any state and province of the entry of the nematode as soon as it's been able to come in. It's almost like we've been waiting at the border for it to come across and snagged it in our laboratory. So this is really fantastic from this, not fantastic having a nematode here, but fantastic because it's really early on that we've caught the nematode. And that's because of support from growers. So here's a summary of our research. We've been sampling fields in Manitoba with soybean. We extract them, this, the fields. This is Naz, um, a PhD student of mine, uh, on this um, with a USDA cyst extractor, a cyst extractor. Uh, these, and then uh, we, uh, Naz looks at the cysts underneath a microscope. And here they are, there's a cyst there. This is a female that's dead and inside her skin, her skin gets hard and inside is, a, is she's packed with eggs, 100 eggs, 150 eggs, okay? And they're just sitting there waiting and they'll survive for years and they can be frozen, they can be dried, they can be exposed to wind chill, they can be exposed to ultraviolet light, they're not gonna die. Not, not very quickly anyway, it'll, it'll, it'll take, five, 10, 15 years from the dot, uh, the eggs. But as soon as there's soybean or something that it likes, then they'll um, stimulate hatching, okay? The molecular analysis, we've actually developed molecular assays to quickly identify the soybean cyst nematode, actually. And here you can see the nematode that we've grown in the laboratory on a root. And here we, we, we grow um, and prove that the nematode uh, is here and thrives on soybean by raising it um, uh, soybean in the greenhouse and um, with a nematode from Manitoba and it does parasitize. Now, 
at first we, we found that in four RMs in Manitoba, very low levels, but in 2021, which if you recall was a very dry uh, mid to late mid summer, this, I got a call to look at this area here. And you see the stunted area here, lots of yellowing, stunted plants, really pathetic plants compared to the rest of the field, which is nice and green. Pull up the roots, it's a sandy soil, and lo and behold, you see these white specks. Now, these are not nodules. Nodules would be a lot bigger. These are actually the nematode, the soybean cyst nematode on the soybean. As I saw that, I said, holy smokes, we have it in a very high level. We were able to take this nematode, grow soybean in the laboratory, and we can see the cysts growing on the um, um, roots. So it was really conclusive. Now this was a drought year, and that's when nematode damage to root systems manifests itself so easy as to see. So it was an ideal situation here because it was dry because the roots are compromised, can't take up water and nutrients under dry conditions, the plant is extremely stressed then, compounded stress, and we can see it. This is really neat. We followed up with uh, detailed sampling, actually a consulted group uh, did the sampling, um, uh, field to field did the sampling on a grid basis, and we did the analysis in the laboratory for this SCN, and the red areas are the hotspots of high levels. This is the, with a picture I was showing you of that stunted areas right in here, and that was really the focal point. And you can see in this direction here, the nematode seems to be coming up uh, present. This is an entrance away where the machinery comes in, the farm equipment comes in, and the tillage is primarily in this direction here and seeding and all stuff like that. And so you can really see what's happening here. The nematode was brought in. And when, when the implements come, go into the ground, that's where the nematode um, gets seeded to. And then we push it around with our seeders and planters and so forth like that. So uh, really, really classic, classic drug conditions to see the nematode damage and then machinery moving it around and the entry by um, uh, entrance ways as, as the focal point. So this is our map now in green and orange of where soybean cyst nematode is and gray is where we've sampled and haven't been able to find it. So we'll continue hunting for it. Now other nematodes on the prairies, um, Fernando with me, and this is Fernando over here in the corner, uh, did a survey of pulse fields and looking at uh, nematodes and found that there's prevalence of various nematodes. This is that stem nematode because of the presence of um, uh, Canada thistle. It's in uh, almost half of fields. Um, but then we found paratylancus, which is a pin nematode, almost in half the fields, 47%. And another one, the root lesion nematode, 19% of the fields. That's what I want to talk to you about. What are these nematodes doing in our fields? and they can be in very high levels. Are they, do they warrant precaution and um, um, uh, potential cause that they're gonna cause damage, okay? So this is the root lesion nematode and we've collected it all across the prairies and the species that we've found is Pratolanchus neglectus, done that by various molecular means here's the beast here you can really see it's a um, pin here that a stylet that it uses to feed and um, we know from research uh, 10 years over 10 years ago phd student of mine amro uh, that uh, was we found in potato fields in manitoba and we could not find that potato was a host of the nematode so we thought there would be a rotation crop um, in the literature, we see that this nematode has caused damage to peas and lentils in Idaho, okay? It's a pest of canola in wheat in Australia. So Priscilla, our MSc student of mine, did work on with this nematode, and she looked at the nematode and what it likes to feed on and reproduce on. And it turns out 
it really likes soybean the most, followed by chickpea and canola. But it's really the soybean that it, it can consistently reproduce on. These other ones, the canola and the chickpea, are um, it, um, it can reproduce, but not as aggressively, consistently. These are different cycle or generations that we've grown the each of these crops for and you can see in each one of them if the if it, the bar is above this one line that means it's reproduced the taller the bar the more reproduction that has occurred we can see crops like lentil pinto bean wheat spring wheat uh yellow pea it doesn't like to survive on those crops at all actually it dies okay it can't feed on them okay what's it doing with soybean and is it a problem Dr. Tenuta, you have 15 yeah. minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. So we've uh, looked at, at Lethbridge, we've been growing soybean in the field in these micro um, systems here, these collars with soil that has different levels of that nematode. To sh to we've shown in the, in the greenhouse and like soybean, well, how about in the field? <clears throat> Here's examples from last year. Um, this collaborative work with uh, Dr. Chatterton and um, low, medium, high density of the nematode in these collars. And at the end of the season where we've planted soybean in gray, the numbers have increased of the nematode and in black where we did not plant or left the collars, like here's a collar with no plant in it, the levels did not increase. And so we also be able to show that it does like soybean in the field. Okay. I would love to do similar research with um, the chickpea and the uh, canola to see if um, it will latch on or not in the field. Because remember, the, the greenhouse studies say it's kind of borderline if it's going to survive, but the soybean, it really does, does like it. Um, now, this is Fernanda here, is my main technician in this research now, looking at different varieties of soybean and the variation and susceptibility uh, of uh, that uh, Gurlesian nematode. And you can see very high levels of uh, the nematode in roots, really, because it lives in the roots of the uh, soybean. And um, here are the levels. Uh, thousand per kilogram of fresh uh, root material. Uh, there seems to be difference in varieties, but when we do the statistical difference, so much variation, we have 10 replicates for each of these varieties and there's so much variation within the replicate. You can see the high standard deviation that's here. There's no statistical difference. So it just really likes all soybean. Now uh, we're continuing this with, with more varieties from different genetics from companies. The, to really conclude this or not, but uh, we hope to be able to finish that within two months from now as well. Now, I wanna mention about um, uh, the chickpea issue that you're very aware of. So South Central Saskatchewan, uh, Cinnaboya, uh, my in-laws are in Gravelberg. Uh, and this area here, we have the, um, this mysterious chickpea disease, chlorosis uh, around the leaflet uh, edges, um, dying very quickly in the field. We've been getting samples, Sarah has been um, rooting samples uh, to us, uh, Dr. Michelle Hubbard with Ag Canada as well. And what we've been finding is generally the, the soils in this area are extremely high in one nematode, this pin nematode that was almost in 50% of all pulse fields. But it's an astronomical levels in this region. We're talking 15, 16,000 nematodes per kilogram. That is massive. I've never seen such high levels of one particular nematode. This is like maybe what you get in an orchard, like a, in a, a, a vineyard where you have plants growing for 30, 40 years and the nematodes can build up their levels. But in a, in a field crop system, it's almost unheard of. So we really were intrigued if there's a linkage or not. And this is the nematode here. This is a female with its long uh, spear. That's why it's called the pin nematode, because it looks like a pin. This is a juvenile, which would be a second stage. 
Uh, so just immature, it's not male or female yet, and it has no feeding apparatus. That's pretty unique to this group, that it needs to be at the third molt that it starts to pick up a stylet and starts feeding. Otherwise, it's just hanging out, um, I guess, kind of like what our um, teenagers do, right? Just kind of hang out and don't do anything good. Um, but, you know, at some point they, they do wisen up and start to uh, um, get a stylet and start feeding and making a living. And... Um, and they grow. They're growing out there, obviously, because they're in high levels. And sample after sample that we're getting, extremely high levels, and even high levels down to two feet in soil. Uh, just phenomenal. And there's this is tough to, to make a linkage because we've been sampling with Sarah, or sorry, we've been analyzing. Sarah's been sampling with her crew. <coughs> There's a loose association um, uh, between higher levels and severely impact. These are severely impacted fields around the Willow Bunch, Cinnaboya area. And there's some high levels here, but like extremely high levels here in these two soils and your Dinsmore, but uh, these were one, one section was symptomatic and, and uh, healthy area unsymptomatic even higher levels. So we have a big challenge with nematodes. I talk, started out by saying they're challenging for field diagnosis. And it's because you can have a nematode problems, but it depends on the soil conditions, the salinity, the moisture, the organic matter, the nutrients, if you're gonna see a disease or not, or the symptoms, okay? So this is really challenging uh, for us to uh, really pin this forward. We're, we're, we're doing our best by in the greenhouse, uh, challenging the nematode to chickpea and, and try different varieties as well. There seems to be a, a connection here, but we haven't made it, uh, uh, pinpointed it down, pardon the pun there for the pin nematode. Um, but I'd like to really use nematicides and say, okay, let's use a nematicide to take the nematodes down and see if we lose any symptom development in fields. I think that's gonna need to be what we have to do. The potential nematode issues down the line, I'm not gonna go into all of these, but we gotta be vigilant. We need trained students, we need technicians, we need facilities, we need laboratories that can do this work. Because if we get caught with any of these major issues, we can be holding back exportation of crops, grains, tubers, root material um, uh, around the world. Lots of contributors here, lots of people, as you can see. We don't do, I don't do this research on my own. Actually, I'm hardly in the lab. I wish I was in the lab. Lots of people to thank and thank you. Please follow us on at Soil Ecology Human uh, on Twitter and follow us on our homepage. We do have one page um, on, on this uh, project area on our website. And um, with that, thank you very much. Hope we have some time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tenuta. It was a great presentation and I think really opened our eyes to just yeah, how complicated uh, this is. You have uh, uh, some questions coming into the question box. So for starters, um, are there any commercial labs that offer a nematode ID or um, detection uh, in, in soils? Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, there are some labs. University of Guelph does provide a, a service. Uh, general service, um, mainly because they have a lot of hort crops out there, and um, so they do that. Um, here on the prairies, no. Um, Agvise will do analysis for soybean cyst nematode, and they can receive uh, samples of, from Canada for soybean, for soybean cyst nematode, but otherwise are, are, are it's really slim, you know, I mean, your best bet is probably through me if it's something like that's new and stuff like that because we're still at the research stage, right? Um, uh, but we do need to gear up our diagnostic services, our provincial diagnostics labs, I think is a key thing that we need to get uh, people in there and training. I love to be hosting people for training in my laboratory so that they can take methodologies uh, back to their labs. Perfect. 
Um, I, I guess on that front as well, is there thresholds that are readily set up? You've kind of walked through that there's some, you know, we know when stuff is really high, but is there some lines? Do we have clear thresholds set up? Yeah, so the ones that we might mainly we're talking about today, uh, the soil ones like the root lesion nematode and the pin nematode, usually we're talking about 1,000 to 2,000 per kilogram of soil. So I was showing you like 8,000 uh, for the pin nematode from those chickpea fields. That's what I mean, that's out of this world levels. So I, I wouldn't be surprised that I would expect a disease issue of, of those nematodes there. Okay. And so, um, but nematodes are highly variable in space from, you know, we just have to go 10 feet and you, you can drastically go up or down. So you have to be careful. You, it's, 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 it's not like a, a plant analysis of nutrient levels that you say, oh, I'm short on my uh, zinc and copper, you know, uh, it's not, it's not as, as, as um, em empirical like that, okay? Okay. So I say generally more than a thousand for those soil ones, that's a problem. Other ones, other nematodes, um, especially the viral vector ones, um, any of them is a problem. <coughs> Excuse me, and of the quarantine nematodes, the, the, the trade issue nematodes, zero is okay. your threshold. Sorry, one is your threshold. Um, on that front, is there practices for increasing or, or improving the healthy nematode population? Um, you kind of mentioned manure. What can we do to sort of get that, that balance right in the soil? No tillage, increase our organic matter, increase plant diversity in terms of our crop diversity, uh, healthy rotations, long rotations between crops. Uh, don't grow canola on canola on canola on wheat on canola. Um, don't don't grow, just grow pulse crops. Uh, rotate, rotate, rotate. Um, and uh, what else can we do? Um, uh, weed control is very important because weeds can be alternate hosts for the nematodes. And uh, keep machinery clean when moving between fields. I know we say this all the time, and you know, club root and and so forth have really made us aware of this transport but we need to really I know it's a pain I know it's a pain but we do need to make sure we don't move soil between fields okay excellent uh, speaking of the the soil front um can you tell us more about what soil conditions are favorable for nematodes to thrive um is there salinity or or, or moisture that's that's sort of attracting them um or or is it really host specific more so than soil or management specific so um, people think that say for example they say oh sand soils um, nematodes love sand soils because that's where diseases show up first uh, it's the reason why they show up first there is because the plant can be more stressed because on this on a coarse soil right because the root system is compromised and can pick up water and water availability is already low on a sand so if we go we could see that uh, on a clay soils, the nematodes love clay as well. It's just that the plants aren't as stressed on the clay. And so it takes a few years down the road to see the damage occurring, right? So in a nutshell, nematodes like any soils. I even, you know, I started off by saying they like Antarctica dry valleys that only have a, a growing season of one day. Um, so uh, soil's not a problem. Salinity situations, not a problem. Chances are, if you have a salinity issue, you're you're not worried about the nematodes. You're probably worried about the salinity. Um, but uh, yeah, no, they will be on any type of soil. And you know, when I first, I was in California before I came here, doing nematode work, and people said to me, "Why are you going there? It's frozen hell up there, and there's no nematodes that are going to survive." And I said, "I think you're wrong." Um, and these were even nematologists were telling me this, right? And they're wrong. Um, the winters are um, they can survive. Um, they they can survive dry periods, which also allows them to survive frozen periods. It's the same mechanism of adaption. So um, yeah, no, they they just love soil and they love hosts. Okay. 
So we are expecting these nematode populations to increase. They're overwintering and they'll continue to build in presence of a, of a host crop. Yes, so you can see, let's say, for example, soybeans, a classic example, it, it's come into Manitoba and the nematode is folded. Um, now, when we start having issues with uh, canola now, in terms of a number of years, Australia started having uh, issues with the Pranolinchus neglectus after growing um, um, rapeseed canola um, and their spring wheat there. Um, I'm expecting that we're going to have a bigger and bigger issues um, here on the prairies as well. And I, I didn't, it's at the end of my presentation, I didn't want to show it today, but uh, I did some funny business with uh, global warming and warming temperatures and the impact on the generation time of the nematode's life cycle. And for the prairie area, I was, I think I used Regina as a base, um, a generation time for um, a really devastating uh, root lesion nematode, Pranolinchus penetrans. Um, it was the generation time um, of a 1.5 degree warming temperature, global warming, which I think is easy for us to get to by um, 2050, is going to be, um, it reduced the generation time by eight days. Um, so we, you'd be able to squeeze in and um, probably by the whole growing season, you know, an extra generation. Okay, so on a generation, think of that as multiplying the, the population by 50. And if you can get two or three generations, so that's that's like two or three times 50. So you can see the numbers ramp up pretty quickly. Wow. Well, we do have a few more questions that have come in through the question box, but in interest of time, I think we'll cut off that great discussion there. So thank you to all of our participants. And thank you, of course, again to you, Dr. Tenuta. Um, you've left us with some great um, information to wrap up today's session. We uh, we will have an opportunity to, to tap you again for a little bit more uh, information to, to answer those unanswered questions, and we'll disseminate that information. Recording yeah, from today. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's good. Perfect. <laughs> the recording from today will be posted on SBG's website um, and everyone will receive an email on how to access it. Also receive an email with a link to a survey for you to share for your feedback and uh, your opinion really helps SBG deliver valuable extension opportunities and to continuously improve. One last uh, parting comment is that registration is now open for SBG's Winter Pulse meetings. We'll once again be making stops in local communities of Regina, Assiniboia, Elrose, and Melfort for January, February, and March. And uh, please check out our website, saspulse.com, for more information. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah and Amanda. Take care.